So um, let's talk briefly just about what the ASCU scholars are. And along the way, I'm actually going to ask Christian and, and uh, Jordan to jump in a little bit here. And when we do that, we'll have them introduce themselves. Um, ASCU scholars has actually been around for several years. It's taken a few different forms over time. It used to be a program that students applied to only in their second year, and it was a two-year program for third and fourth years, and you were actually part of the program for two years. When I became director in 2019, we altered that uh, to make it a one-year program, largely because the prior application process asked folks in their second year to define how they view themselves as a change agent. So I thought that was, after talking with students, I thought it was really hard for most 19 or 20 year olds to write an essay defining themselves as a change agent. And I thought we were setting a bar that actually very few students could meet. And so I thought we could be a lot more flexible. We could reduce some barriers and make this a more open program to students uh, who really see themselves as wanting to engage in issues, but may not have fully thought through by the end of their, by their fourth semester, potentially, how they actually want to do that or where they see themselves pursuing change and that kind of stuff. So I wanted there to be more opportunity. You can still apply as a second year. So really as a rising junior or rising senior, you can still apply. Um, it is a one-year program. Folks who might apply as a rising junior, if your project might require a second year and potential second round of funding, we can talk about that, right? So we are open to supporting a two-year project, but it's not a required two-year project, okay? So that's just really quickly a, a, a quick overview in that context. What types of projects do we want people working on? This is a research initiative. So the, the Graham Center has three levels of re undergraduate research initiatives. Has anybody been a civic scholar uh, part of our civic scholars. Okay, so that's an entry level research initiative. So really we're teaching research design and that and just kind of basic uh, approaches to research. Our Haskell scholars, has anybody been a Haskell scholar uh, part of that? That's a project which is kind of mid-level. So it's actually submitted by a faculty member and we provide $3,000 to support the research project but they're required to bring on an undergraduate research assistant and we provide 750 to the research assistant to help support them and make them be included in the project. Ask you is what we consider an, an advanced undergraduate research initiative. So you guys as students are proposing the project. We do need you to have a faculty mentor, although that's not necessary when you submit the application. We can help you find a mentor if you don't have one. OK, it's obviously better if you have one, because then you know that you've got somebody signed on already to help you. We have never had a circumstance in the four years I've been director where we have not been able to find a mentor for a, a, a student that we've accepted into the program. Every time that we've had somebody come in without a mentor, we have been able to find somebody for them. OK, uh, so that's a conversation we would have individually with you. Uh, if you don't have one in mind, and we can help you do that, and that does not have to be done to be accepted necessarily. So it's helpful, but it's not critical that it be done beforehand. Um, and I'm happy when we get to Q&A, if you have individualized questions, I'm happy to address that in terms of how we go about helping find mentors and, and so on. Um, so that, that mentorship key part is key as well. For ASCU, we provide $2,000, uh, and we'll talk to them about how that can be used in, in a few minutes. To the student, we also provide $1,000 in professional development support to the faculty mentor. That incentivizes them to want to, to work with folks. You know, it, it's, I don't want to say it's bribery, because it's not bribery, because most of the folks want to do it anyways, but it provides some additional support for them, right? Um, and it does provide additional incentive to, to so they can engage uh, and they may use that for all kinds of different things, but it's got to be professional related. So it might be to support travel research, uh, conference travel, uh, purchasing equipment that they might need or, or whatever. Uh, and again, we can uh, talk more individually about that. Um, I'm going to pause there uh, it, it, after this, just this one last comment. What do projects need to be on? So the Graham Center, if you're not familiar with us, is focused on civic engagement, public service, public leadership, and public policy, all broadly defined. 
So students in any major can be engaged in those things. Any professional path you're pursuing, can, you can still engage, lead, and serve within it. So we read those very, very broadly. We've had students from engineering to college of education, obviously liberal arts and sciences, to business, all kinds of different majors involved in this. So I'm gonna pause here and I'm gonna start with, Kristen, why don't you jump in, introduce yourself, tell us you know, a, a little bit about your, your project, your, your major, that kind of thing, and what you're working on. Hi everyone, sorry, I'm feeling a little under the weather, that's why I'm coming over Zoom. But um, my name is Christian Lopez. I'm an international studies major with minors in Spanish and Chinese and a certificate in teaching English as a second language. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, I work with Dr. Laura Gonzalez and we um, currently are working on a, a, a exhibit on language access in, the, in Gainesville's Matheson Museum. If you know where the, like the Cava bar is by Baudelaire Plaza, the Matheson Museum is kind of like right behind there. But I do, I do lots of stuff um, with Dr. Gonzalez and the ASCU scholarship has kind of served as a living stipend for me, as well as um, helping my mentor uh, fund some of the materials that we need for the uh, museum exhibit. But before, um, before we started the, the exhibit, I was actually working with uh, Dr. Gonzalez when I first applied the ASCU scholarship um, on a language access toolkit, kind of a resource for nonprofit organizations to use to be more inclusive to, um, we, they're called limited, um, LEP individuals, limited English proficiency. Um, individuals, so a resource for nonprofits to be more inclusive to those individuals. And yeah, I've really enjoyed working with Dr. Gonzalez and the ASCU scholarship has been a big help in that. Um, I know specifically some a, an expensive purchase that we had to make recently was we were trying to figure out what was the best material for this, um, our like infographics almost, um, in the Master Museum, and we discovered this pro. We we were in communication with the people who work at the exhibit, and we actually had we got them made out of Sintra, which is kind of like this cardboard plasticky combination, and that was not uh, cheap. So the ASCU funds have definitely been helpful in in paying for things for the exhibit, such as that. Great, excellent. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, and then Jordan, do you want to talk about what what you're doing? Yeah, my name is Jordan. Uh, I'm a third year political science and history major with minors in Russian and East Central European studies. Uh, and my project um, is about access to reproductive care in Florida's women's prisons and jails, um, specifically like the policy uh, that has surrounded it and like a lot of the changes that have happened in some cases where uh, there hasn't been adequate access or care for women in prison. Uh, who come in and are pregnant. Um, and also the project, since it began, because I got it last March and then Roe v. Wade was overturned in June, uh, has talked about like some of the reaction to that and some of the like theories that have developed about uh, how the access to care will change or uh, whether there will be access to care. Uh, and my mentor is Dr. Bonnie Ernst. Excellent. So those are two projects. Both of, of, of these students are obviously within liberal arts and sciences, and they're doing projects that would align a little bit more with the social sciences or perhaps on the humanities side of things. But I want to be clear, we work with students across all of campus. So one of the, um, the first years I, I was director here, we had somebody from the College of Engineering who was working on climate change and Florida's responses to algae blooms. We've done multiple projects on climate change. We've done multiple projects on uh, public health. We did one on the opioid crisis. Uh, we've done stuff on um, the shortfall of foster care housing. We had a student do one on childhood diabetes. Um, there's one uh, who worked on um, the study of the Holocaust and teaching of the Holocaust in Florida public schools. So the, the point is we've got folks working all across 
campus. So think very broadly about civic engagement, public service, public leadership, public policy, and how you might connect with that. So a couple of other things that I want to highlight based on, on what they were talking about. So Christian's working with Dr. Gonzalez, and they're up working with the Matheson Museum here in town to do an exhibit on something. And through that, they're also working with other community organizations. So these, these uh, asking projects are supposed to be research-based, but you can do that in some ways in partnership with community organizations. There are some constraints there on how we can spend money. And again, I'll, I'll talk more about the money and, and, and what we can do with it and that stuff in a couple of minutes. But you can, again, think broadly about how might you do research that might connect you with a nonprofit in some way or some other group in the community. Uh, and obviously in Jordan's case, working on, on healthcare, women's healthcare in prison, He's had to connect in certain ways with communities, right, that aren't bounded by this campus, right? You know, so you can think pretty broadly about some of those ideas as well. So in terms of money, so students get $2,000 to support the research. The faculty uh, mentor gets $1,000 uh, for professional development. What can you use that $2,000 for? The, Thing that most students use it for is as a direct disbursement to your student financial services account. Uh, $2,000, it goes straight to you. Um, what you do with it once you have that fund or, or those monies available is kind of up to you. So think here about, say you're a person like I was, I worked as an undergraduate, paid my own way through school, so I was working 30 hours a week. If I'd been given $2,000 to support research, I might have only been at having to work 15 hours a week or something like that, right? So when we think about supporting your research, Christian mentioned using it to support living expenses. That is perfectly fine. So in the application, you're asked, how do you intend to use the funds? It is okay to put a sentence there that says, I would like to take the funds as a disbursement to student financial services and use them to support living expenses. That is perfectly acceptable. Okay, but if you want to do other things with them, that is also acceptable. So if somebody needs to travel, say you're a historian and historians do research in archives and something like that, you need to travel. We can sponsor your travel, pay for your travel. So hotel, if it's potentially mileage, if you're driving someplace, say you're going to the state archives in Tallahassee or something like that, we can cover those costs. If you are doing something where you need to purchase goods, uh, we can potentially do that. I say potentially because there are a couple of limitations there. We cannot buy you a new computer, okay? If that question comes up a lot. We cannot buy you a new computer because these are, in whatever we buy, is unless it's like single use, it is university property. So I can't buy you a computer. We had, did have a project where somebody was doing interviews and they were working with someone in oral history and they wanted to GoPro to record their interviews. We actually bought the GoPro, but bought it for oral history. The student could still use it, but it stayed with oral history, right? It's their property. So we we're still able to support it, but anything that's like a, a, a durable good like that is considered university property. So I can't buy it and give it to you and then have you walk off with it. We can try to be creative about ways that we can work with you and with whoever your mentor might be to support some of those kinds of things. Software licenses, we can pay for that. Um, if you're doing a survey and you want to be able to, to pay to get that distributed in some place, we can do that, right? So we can think about those kinds of things. I mentioned the student who did the project on childhood diabetes. She had, um, this was a 2019-2020 ASCU scholar. She uh, did case studies of 66 different people. And there were people she met here at UF, there were people she'd gone to high school with, other folks that she knew from that community. And she did these kind of poster board presentations and it was actually supposed to go up on display in the rights union and that little art area over there. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic hit. And so she had 66 posters that she couldn't display anywhere. So that, that's unfortunate, but we paid for the production of those 66 posters, right? So. That's another space to, to think about if you've got materials that you need purchased for your project, we can do that. We can do that cheaper than you probably can buy them yourselves because we are tax exempt. 
We also, because of UF, have contracts with different uh, vendors around town and around the state. So we may be able to purchase stuff significantly cheaper than what you can. Okay, so just be aware of that. That might help in different ways. So if you're trying to maximize your funds, you might say, oh, I want $1,000 to go to the purchase of these things, and then I'll take $1,000 as disbursement uh, to student financial services. That's also okay. The space where we have the biggest challenge in terms of using funds is when students are working with nonprofits. We cannot buy something for you to donate to a nonprofit. The way federal law works around nonprofit stuff, so if the funds we use to support this were donated, the private donor funds to the center, it would effectively be money laundering, even if the intent is good, for us to take donated funds to us and donate them to another nonprofit. That is what money laundering is, even if the intent is entirely positive, is a violation of federal law. I would end up someplace where he might be studying a different part of the population and the UF would use it, lose its nonprofit status if we did something like that. So if you're working with a nonprofit, how can you actually do that if you want to support them? Again, one thing that we can do is we can provide the funds to you and then you may do what you wish with those funds, right? Um, that is an option that's out there on the table. Just be aware that you are not tax exempt and you don't have both buying power and vendor contracts that UF does. So we, we, you can't have both of those things, right? So just be aware of that when you're thinking about how you might propose your projects. Um, I'll get to your question in just a second, Emily. I do, I do see it there on the chat. Um, so when, you, when you're thinking about if you want to work with a nonprofit, the best way to do it is to focus on the research aspect that you want to do. Because then if you're focusing on the research, we can do what we can to sponsor the research. We can't make a straight donation to the entity, but we can try to be creative about how we sponsor the research and what are appropriate research materials. So there are some ways um, we've worked with, with this one's a, a kind of really complicated. We have a student, um, Sophia De La Cruz, I don't know if any of you know Sophia, who's working with uh, the Quava Freedom School and has a thousand dollars worth of books to donate uh, that she purchased after we dispersed the funds to her. There are other parts of our project though that we're supporting because it's the research side, of it, right? You know, so just some things there to, to, to think about. Emily asked, do all projects need to have a written paper aspect or does this vary project to project, to project like if your deliverable is an exhibit? Bingo, uh, that is exactly right. So. A lot of students use ASCU funds to support senior honors thesis research. And if you're doing an honors thesis, it's likely to be a, a written thing, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that. So again, because we want to work with students in any discipline, imagine we had somebody in film studies and they said, hey, I'd really love to do a documentary. Great, go for it. We'd be happy to, to work with you on that, right? Um, the student who did the, the diabetes, 66 cardboard you know, or, or uh, foam board posters is what the work product was there. In Christian's case, the exhibit at the museum, that is the work product, right? You know, so in some of the, the, the um, language guides and those kinds, of, that is the work product there, right? So it's going to vary by project. Yes, the majority have something that is written and comes out of it, but that does not have to be the case, okay? Other uh, questions on that, those kinds of things, whether it's here in the room or, or on chat. And do feel free to put questions in chat if, if uh, you want. Yeah. How much, if you do submit a proposal, how much can it change as the project ensures sure. it on? So in some cases it can change like completely. Uh, so we had uh, a student that we had accepted into the program and when they got it, once they actually started working on the project, they encountered a couple of obstacles that nobody really could have anticipated. And they're just like, I can't do this, am I done? And they're like, well, let's actually talk to your mentor. Let's think about ways that you can explore a similar question, but through something completely different. And we were able to come up with a completely different way to still do something around the issue, but it was a totally different project, right? So it, it, that can happen. 
right? And so we're open to that. Again, our goal is to try to support you in your research. That, that's what we want to do. So I'm going to be flexible in how we do that. You can also, we've never had one, but you are open to propose a, a partnership with another student if you wish. Um, depending on what the nature of that proposal is, we are open to both students getting the, the stipend, as it were, um, and just make the case to us, right? You know, do the proposal and, and make the case to us. We're, I am open to all, all options, okay? They're all on the table. I want you to work on something that you're excited about and that you're passionate about because you're going to have the best experience if you find something that you're really excited about. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. If you're working on the project as like sort of a group project, so through I'm in FCI and mm -hmm. I'm kind of working with a group to propose, um, to do this proposal, um, would they, would the other students be able to also submit <laughs> or how would that work? So FCI is complicated here for a whole range of reasons. So for those of you who don't know, FCI is Florida Community Innovation. It's actually a nonprofit that's founded by two Graham Center alums, one of whom is a current grad student here at UF. Uh, and so it's it creates certain challenges because it's a non it's operating as a nonprofit, right? And so we have to engage with it as a nonprofit, but it also has student interns who are also doing, helping do the research and the work for it, which is all to the good, but we have to be careful about, because we have to operate with it as a nonprofit, not as something being run by a grad student here at UF, right? So we have to look at that pretty carefully. I would wanna have a more in-depth conversation, probably with the various student participants, also with Carolyn, because, we have to have a faculty mentor. It can't just be a grad student who's the mentor, right? You know, so that would be a more in-depth conversation to have. And I, I don't, the only reason I, I, I'm saying that was I don't want to say definitively yes or definitively no, so I would have more details on it, right? Okay. Other questions? Uh, yeah, Paula. Pa Paola. Paola. Sorry. Yeah, it's Paola. Yeah, um, thank you. So I just wanted a little bit of clarification. You had mentioned that um, kind of give it gave examples of software licenses, posters, printing supplies. Is that coming out of the stipend or is that a separate proposal? So uh, generally speaking, that would come out of the two thousand dollars, right? Uh, so the the two thousand dollars is to support the research. Support the research may mean direct support to the student, or it may mean purchase of goods and, and, and so on. Now, again, I'm open to conversations about if there are um, other expenses. Uh, we want to, to try to be supportive of the project. We don't have unlimited resources, but we want, we want to do what we can to be supportive of the project. So if a student hypothetically said to me, well, look, I'm got to work 20 hours a week and I can't do this research without some kind of, of break there, but I also need to spend $700 buying materials for this. We can have that conversation and see what might be possible there. I might ask for some documentation on, on work or something along those lines just to confirm that, but we can have that conversation. But again, I'm, I'm open to those ideas, okay? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Emily, do you have another question? I see your hand up. Yes, I do. Hi, Dr. Jacobs. Hey. So I had a question. I might be graduating in fall 2023 <laughs> and then finishing out a master's through 2024. So like still being at UF, would that, given the year long range of the stipend and the program, would that exempt me from asking not, you? Yeah, it would not preclude you from potentially participating. So yes, this is in theory a year long program, but you could also have, I was communicating with another student about this um, because not all students are on the eight semester fall spring track, right? You know, I want, for example, students who might be part of um, Innovation Academy to be able to participate as well. So again, I would ask you in your proposal to define your timeline, and we haven't talked about timeline yet, 
but I would ask you to define what your timeline is, right? Let it that be driven by the project. Um, it would be it would be more straightforward to not try to bridge from undergrad to grad, right? To just keep it as an undergrad project, but we can work with that as a summer fall project potentially. Uh, so I would ask you to define what the timeline was and make sure that that's a feasible project to do. Um, but it, it wouldn't preclude you from doing it just because you'd be graduating in the fall. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Um, okay, so let's talk about timeline and, and let's talk a little bit more about the proposal as well in terms of what goes into that. So uh, we ask you to do, in terms of the proposal, uh, two statements. One is a 300 word statement about how you would envision engaging with the Graham Center. So one of the things that we do want from you is to engage with the Graham Center. This isn't just us throwing money out and not wanting anything coming back in, right? We do want you to engage. Now that engagement can take a lot of different forms. We do a lot of public programming here. So maybe it's attending some of our public programs. As ASCU scholars at different points in time, you might be invited to receptions that we have with some of our speakers or things like that. Um, you might have the opportunity to engage in other ways. Sometimes we have small meetings, lunchtime meetings or something like that with some of our speakers. So you would get some invitations to some of those kinds of things. So engagement doesn't isn't necessarily work. Sometimes it's coming and getting free food and getting to talk to people, right? You know, sometimes that's it. Um, we want you to engage, Joe. So for some of you, I'm going to pick on you, Luca, just because I know you're one of our fellows already. You know, Luca comes in, he tables at some of our events. He, he, he was you were working the event. To, no, you weren't working last night. You, but you were just there last night. But um, but he worked some of our events for us, right? You know, so that's great. Uh, and so maybe it's coming in, in when we need. We participate in the undergraduate research um, fair. And so we try to ask some of our scholars to go and, and be with us at that. So it might be helping us at some of those things. Jordan and Christian showed up to this for us, right? I know you have a class that you've got to go to. Or, or did you have the... the uh, it doesn't start until 5 30. Yeah, so. okay. But you know, so they came to this. So engaging with the center can mean lots of different things. There's no one way that we're asking all of you to participate in what we do, okay? Um, we want that to sort of align with, with where your interests are and, and all that. We don't want to force you. We do have six student organizations uh, that, that we sponsor, Mock Trial, Freshman Leadership Council, our Graham Student Fellows are kind of our ambassador group, um, Florida Political Review, Public Leadership Society, the Future of Florida Policy Summit, which takes place this weekend, uh, so there's a lot of different spaces, our public programs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we ask you to write no more than 300 words about what engagement with the center might look like for you. If you've been engaged with the center already in different ways, you can draw on that as well um, to, to sort of convey that. That's, that's fine. So that's the one statement. The second statement is about your project, and that's a 500-word statement. So that's you know, double space. That's two pages, basically. Um, we want you to define your project. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to be able to answer every possible thing about your project, but you should be thinking about what is the question you're trying to explore? How are you going to do that, right? Um, are you going to do surveys? Are you going to try to, um, you know, what sources of data are you going to be trying to look at? How are you going, if you're going to be interviewing people, how are you going to, to do that, right? Or do you have some examples not your whole list of, of people that you want to interview, but are there three or four that you can identify that give us a sense of the types of people that you want to be interviewing, that kind of thing. Um, within that proposal, you should have a timeline. That timeline is an estimation, okay? As an example, if you want to do surveys, if you do not build in time for IRB review, IRB is the Institutional Review Board that reviews all surveys and other types of, of human subject and animal subject research. If you don't build in time for that review, well, that's a month out of your timeline that's gone, right? You know, so it doesn't mean that you have to have it hard and fast, but we want to make sure this person has thought through the steps of this process, right? Um, and that's where if you have a mentor in mind already, having a conversation with them, 
can be really helpful as you're putting the proposal together. If you don't have a mentor and you're trying to think through something, you can come and talk to me. Uh, I've already talked with four or five students about possible projects and what would a timeline look like for that uh, as well. Um, and so feel free to do that. I do have standing office hours. They're Tuesdays, uh, 10.30 to noon, and Wednesdays, 1.30 to 3. And I'm in almost every day. So you can set up appointments with me and stuff like that to talk to me as well uh, if you don't have a mentor in mind. Uh, so that timeline, again, it gives us a sense that you have a, an idea of what you're trying to do, what it actually looks like to do this project. When we actually evaluate them and the, the proposals, and there'll be a review committee, let me also say we do not have a set number of ask use. Uh, this, this is Sophia. She's, a, the, um, she's an undergrad assistant, one of the student assistants here in the center who works with me on our research initiatives. Uh, so she helps do all the administrative background stuff and help set all this up and, and everything. So, Sorry, give me a lot of breath. I just came from class. <laughs> uh, so uh, she's also a resource to ask questions of uh, because, again, she helped work on all this stuff with me. Um, when, so when we're talking about the, the evaluation process, we do not have a set number of uh, proposals that we're going to fund, okay? So when we they come in, there's a review committee. We will look at that. We'll ask or we'll decide which of these are fundable or not fundable however many that number is. So if we have 20 proposals, we may look at that and say 13 or 14 of these are fundable proposals. Then it's my decision, can we fund all of those or not, right? And if we can, then we will fund all the ones that we believe are fundable. Sometimes we will have a situation where we might be able to fund more than what we initially think are fundable, and we may actually go back to some people and say, hey, you know, the review committee had a couple more questions about this. Can you give us a little bit more information? And we may be able to kind of lead you down the path that would make your project fundable. So we did that a couple of years ago with two students, right? As you've designed this, we're not really sure it can work the way you, you set it up, but what if you tweaked it like this? And like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Dad, that could really work. Like, okay, you got it, right? You know, so, so there can be some give and take in this process as well. Um, I will say just based on the information session and the other folks I've spoken to, this is by, if all of you submit proposals, this will be by far the largest number of applications we've, we've ever received for. We've never received more than 12 uh, the applications before. Um, I think this is great. Uh, I hope you all have fundable proposals and I would love to be able to fund as many of them as I possibly can, right? You know, so I, I, I say that specifically to, to not, I don't want you to view this as, oh, I'm competing with everybody around this table for them. I want you to focus on what you want to do, why you want to do it and how you're going to do it. Make that case and then make me make a decision with the review committee over whether we think that's fundable. And then I'll figure out, you know, I'll look at our money and see what we can do. Okay. So really think about it in those terms as opposed to who am I competing with here? All right. Uh, view it, view it as the opportunity that you're pursuing that as, as looking around the room and eyeing up your competition. Okay. Uh, and none of you are doing that, you know, but I, I, I've worked with enough undergrads to know how this works. So, uh, okay. So that's, uh, I see uh, B has a, uh, has a question, does our mentor need to come from a certain department? No, your, your mentor should be a faculty member uh, in the University of Florida. Faculty member can be very broadly defined. Um, so as an example, you know, I'm a, a tenured faculty member in the Department of History, that's my tenure home. Dr. Cornicione, who's a lecturer here, and she teaches in, in political, her, her courses are across us with political science, but she's a faculty member here. Kevin Bird is faculty member here. They're lecturers. Marianne Vernetson, our associate director, is a lecturer. They're all faculty members. Those are all folks just here in the center who can also serve as mentors, by the way. They're not precluded. There's no conflict of interest in that. Um, but you can have a mentor from any department uh, on this campus, okay? They just have to be have faculty standing to be 
the, the formal mentor because uh, there are limits on how we can do like professional development and stuff like that. Uh, so that you have to have faculty standing, okay? Uh, and, and not, um, if they're an adjunct faculty, we may be able to work with them. That would be because adjuncts are paid on a per course basis. Uh, they, they're not permanent faculty members. We've worked with them in the past. We just have to figure out the best way to do it, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm open to that. We just need to navigate the, that and figure out the best way to do it. Um, was well, there other question. other questions? Uh, uh, Paula, yeah. Yeah, so I was wondering, would you recommend that we run our project either uh, by you or um, just to ensure that it's fundable? I know that the website, you know, very, uh, very much specified. So civic engagement, public policy, public leadership, public service, broadly defined. Um, so, you know, for example, mine's pertaining to civic education and just the education system. So I just didn't know if, like, how specific or how broadly defined that could really fall under? Well, I, I would say just as a general idea, civic education would certainly fall under civic engagement, public yeah. service, public leadership, uh, public policy development broadly. Uh, so just you have to actually work pretty hard to for me to tell you that that just as an idea wouldn't be possible. Um, and so I think the, the we, I'm happy to talk with you more but just the idea of civic education, certainly that would fall within the parameters of the type of project that we could support potentially. Okay, yeah, because I think it mostly civic education on the on the aspect of private schools versus public, just because it's so hard to get into pri uh, public schools um, and do research in public schools nowadays. So with like the state of education in Florida. Yeah, so we could obviously talk about that you know, in the, try to identify the best places to have a mentor that could help you access some of that kind of stuff that, that would, whether that's in college of education or potentially someone in political science or, or something along those lines, or you might already have a mentor in mind too, but trying to think through the best way to actually approach that uh, certainly, but as a general topic, that would certainly be uh, fine. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Other questions? Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to bring up observation. I was um, by the School of Music today, and there's a performance of the UAP Symphonic Band uh, Celebration of African American Composers and those who celebrate civil rights. So it's a musical performance that, if you were musically minded, or you know you have a minor music or something, and you want to do something outside of a more traditional uh, public service project, I would. I would go to your concert if you were to put together a concert, yeah. or an art exhibit, or something outside of. Um... Be creative. Yes. Be creative, right? This is interdisciplinary. So we don't, I am specifically saying we don't want to just think everybody's going to do this the same way. By the way, I did not introduce her. This is Dorothy Zimmerman. She's our communications director. So uh, she will also be publicizing your work. So when we identify the next uh, cohort of ASCII scholars, she will be getting information from you, headshots, you know, a brief statement about what you're working on. It will go up on our website, it'll go out through social media, all that kind of stuff uh, as well. So uh, yeah, and this, by the way, this recording will be put up uh, and accessible. Is it gonna go on the YouTube channel or where? Uh, this thing's uh, yes, it will go up on our YouTube channel and be available for you to access okay. before the deadline. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, before the deadline. Uh, other questions on, on the proposal. So the idea of, of having, being able to just describe the basic project that you want to do, you know, what question you're trying to address, a timeline, what types of sources you might be able to to need or whether again it's a survey or or whatever how are you going to do that to give you another example of a project that we're working with we have a student um, exploring the impact of social media push technology like advertising technology and its impact on personal behavior around uh environmental policies like recycling and stuff like that so they you know, they bought certain ads that they use money to buy certain ads and to push those out within a particular area. And then they're looking at 
okay, do they notice any uptick in, in recycling behavior or anything like that in that area? And so, on. so that's, again, something that I'm a historian by training. That's not a project design that I'm going to think about, but I'm delighted that we're able to support something like that, right? So other questions. Yeah, apologies if this is a uh, repeated question, but I came in late. But uh, what role does the mentor play, or how much of a role does the mentor have to play when it comes to your proposed project? Right. So the mentor is going to be the primary person guiding your work. Okay. So that can take different forms depending on how you're doing your project. So if you are doing your project as an honors thesis in a major, you're probably also going to be getting academic credit. Your mentor will likely be in your major, and they would be the supervisor of that academic credit, right? So in that way, they're not only helping guide the project, they're, they're actually playing a much more formal academic role. But you might not be doing it for academic credit. You might not be doing it for an honors thesis. You might be doing it as just a separate thing altogether. But again, the mentor is somebody that you should be communicating with regularly uh, on the project. They're the, the person that you should be turning to when you have questions about how do I do this? You know, what's the next step I should be taking? How do I analyze this data, et cetera? They're the one that should be working with you in that regard, uh, because it, ideally it's a mentor who works in the space or works on a topic that you're trying to, to explore. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Other questions on, on that? Okay. I, I want to go back then uh, just a little bit more on the, the funding. I've talked about the disbursement types. Uh, you know, that it can be used to purchase things, that it can go as disbursement to your uh, accounts. What we typically do, uh, this, this current year has been a little bit different for a couple of different reasons. Um, what we currently do, is, or what we, we typically do is a disbursement in the first semester and a disbursement in the second semester. Right now, that is typical. That doesn't mean that that's what always happens. Because uh, let me use Emily as an example, since she said you know, she's graduating after the fall potentially, and maybe hers would just be a fall disbursement and it would all go at once. Or maybe you need to purchase materials up front to be able to do something, and you need the money either dispersed to you early on, or you need us to make purchases for you early on. That's all negotiable, right? That is all on the table. When I say typically it, it, it's a disbursement each semester, that is for the student who doesn't need goods purchased, who's just taking it as a straight disbursement into their student account, and it's just $1,000 each semester. That has been different in, for Christian and Jordan this year and, and this year's cohort because we had our office manager departed in September, and so we had a couple of issues there. And so we ended up just doing one single disbursement late in the fall semester because we were behind on the, the first one and we wanted to just get it taken care of. And so we just did one lump sum to everybody. Uh, I mean, everybody who was taking it as a disbursement, we just did a single $2,000 disbursement to everybody. That actually isn't the standard practice here. We do typically break it up and do it each semester, okay? Um, but again, that is negotiable with individual students depending on what they're doing for the projects, okay? And I will reiterate, if you are a second year now and potentially applying for next year, if you think your project might take two years, we can have that conversation either now as part of the application process or as you're getting into it, wait a second, this might take me a little longer. Here's, you know, I wanted to, or I'm into it and I, I can see I can go two or three more steps if I extend this a year. We can talk about that as a possibility as well, potentially giving you additional funding to support that. We have one student right now uh, who was part of this year's cohort who ended up for a variety of reasons just deferring till next year. So we just said, okay, we'll just do yours next year. So he would actually be part of your cohort next year, even though he was accepted as part of last spring's application. So we're open to all of these different ideas here. So what I tell students all the time, and it doesn't matter if it's for ask you or anything else, the only sure no is if you don't apply. That's a definite no. 
right? If you don't make somebody make a decision, it's a definite no. But otherwise, make us make a decision, right? You know, put the weight on our shoulders to decide. Um, we can't do that if you don't submit an application. Make me go look at money and see, can we swing this, right? You know, I would much rather do that than to be able to say, hey, I can't give this money away, right? Um, so I would much rather have to, to make those kinds of decisions, okay? Are there other questions? Yeah. If you potentially want to have two mentors, like to kind of guide you in different yep. aspects of the project, yep. would the money get split in half between? Yeah, them? so great question. I actually got this uh, email uh, one last night and one this morning from uh, a paired mentor for one student. Typically, yes, we would split the money. But again, what do they want to use it for? Uh, so as an example, say one of them wants to go to a conference and it's going to cost 650 bucks. It's a thousand dollars that get, goes to the mentors. I'm not going to say, well, here's only 500 and you got to go spend 150 out of pocket. You know, they couldn't come to me and say they each wanted to spend $1,500. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I can't do that. But within reason, I can look at that, you know, if they each came to me and said, well, look, I've got something that's 650 and the other one's like, I've got something that's 600. I'm going to cover that, right? You know, so that's kind of the way we would deal with it. Okay. But yes, as kind of the general rule of thumb, we would split the each Okay. Okay. Other questions? I have a question. Yeah. I know you mentioned um, they obviously providing finding directly to nonprofit is is a no go. But um, have you ever provided funding to start a nonprofit? Um, we have not done that through this initiative. There was there was a separate initiative that was funded out of uh, the CEO's office specifically to promote town gown relations and to work with nonprofits. And we were the administrator of that program. And so in that instance, we were able to use those funds to do that because that was the purpose of those funds. Um, that's a, some of you may have heard of a program called Assembly for Action. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, the folks who founded it graduated two or three years ago. Um, that was the whole point of that program. And so it was funded through the CEO's office specifically to do that uh, kind of thing. So we were able to do that because that was the intent and those weren't donated funds. Those were CEO's funds to, to do that. So for this, we cannot, because that would be the same thing if the donor wanted to start a non, want to fund the start of a nonprofit on that issue, whatever that issue might be, in theory, they could have used their funds to do just that, right? Does that make sense? So if if I'm giving the funds per, privately, I can do with those funds and obviously start. Yeah. Okay. But you wouldn't promote it from like a marketing or communications angle that like I've started a nonprofit. As so a the, that's another uh, issue altogether. Um, so there are new university rules in place that we cannot, unless something has been vetted and is part of UF's campaign for charities, we can't actively promote a nonprofit itself because if we do it with a nonprofit that's not part of UF's approved campaign for charities, we have to be willing to do it for any nonprofit, right? Um, same thing if we, this is a, a little bit of a tangent, but if you're familiar with the new student org rules, whether you have university sponsored student organizations and general registered student organizations, no university entity can actually formally promote a general registered student organization because if you do it for one, you have to be willing to do it for any. Um, and student orgs can be formed around any number of things, right? So it's the same kind of thing with the with the nonprofits. We have to be that, and that's part of the issue with, with FCI, but we have to be really careful there too, right? It, it's, um, we have to deal with that as the nonprofit side, not as the student side of it, right? And so we have to navigate that. And that's why I said we'd have to have a longer conversation about that. And Carol and I talk about that all the time, by the way, so regularly. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so, does that make sense? 
Yeah, no, that absolutely makes sense. Uh, I guess that just have to be, a, cause that's like one of the, the, the goals obviously of, of, of this whole project is to create an entity and then create public server service that way. Right. And, and so that, that's why I say, you know, for us, a lot of these rules have been implemented um, in the last two to three years. And so things that we could do for ASCII programs four or five years ago, we can't do now. And so we've had to kind of reimagine that and figure out how can we still support students who want to engage with community organizations um, and still obviously comply with the, the relevant rules and they're not they're university rules but they're also state law and federal law and so on how do we do that and so we're trying to be creative and supportive but also legal so <laughs> other other questions well thank you all for for coming i'm delighted to see this much interest in it uh, thank you to Christian and, and Jordan for, for hanging out here. Feel free to ask them questions as well. Um, I guess there is one other point I want to make, uh, and this is something that we're going to try next year a little more formally than we have um, to this point as well. You'll know on the website that it talks about you know, wanting you to take a class that's somehow connected to what you're doing. You might have already taken a class that is relevant, you know, so you might have your, your research project might evolve out of something you've done in the class or, or something along those lines. That's fine. We can count that class or alternatively, like uh, as an example, Marianne Burnettson teaches a class this semester on nonprofit and public service leadership uh, and management. You know, she's going to teach that class next year. So if you're doing something on with nonprofits, that could be a relevant class, right? You know, so there are, there's a lot of flexibility in that, but basically the point is let's connect the research to your academics in some way. The other part that it talks about is leadership development and some of that kind of thing. We're actually going to do some more formal work next year through bringing the cohort together than what we've done this year. So this year we had a meeting each semester, but we'll probably try to do something at least twice a semester, is twice a semester, focus more around leadership development, and really have more of a cohort feel than what we've had thus far. With all the pandemic stuff, we've had to change modalities so many times that now this year we're actually just happy to be able to run the program in a normal way, but we want to try to actually, again, bring back a little bit more of that sense of a cohort that existed in, in some prior years, and, and we weren't able to do that this year in quite the same way. So that's something else that Jordan and Christian have, have not gotten from the program that I wish that you'd been able to um, for a variety of reasons. I think it would have benefited everybody, not least of all the, the, the center itself, right? To, to have more direct engagement that way coming from our side uh, and not necessarily being driven by the students, but coming from, from our side. So we'll be doing a little bit more of that next year also, okay? Anything else? Great. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Feel free to reach out to me. My email is just mjacobs at ufl.edu. You can also reach out to Sophia, uh, Sophia Ethan at ufl.edu. So S O T H I A A T H A N uh, at ufl.edu. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Excellent. Thank you.